good uh, presentation. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Andrew. Um, I'm just going to go over today a little bit about uh, basically running a real-time GraphQL API on top of the cloud platform with uh, Terraform. So a little bit about me. Obviously, I like to make jokes. Everyone here can make a joke about my height. I'm seven. I'm like a, I'm like a huge dude. So I'm seven feet tall. Obviously, I have red hair. I'm terrible at basketball. If everyone asks, don't ask. Um, about two months ago, I became the founder and CEO of my new company called Bolt Source. Um, up until then, I was the head of cloud services in a company called Gatsby.js, which is a static site generator for React. Um, also, a repatriated Austinite. Um, spent about six years out in Silicon Valley, recently moved back, so it's good to be back. Yeah, so on that note, I wanted to start the talk with a bit of a cautionary tale. Um, can't exactly say what company this was, but I can say that it was a, a healthcare startup that I used to work at um, out in Palo Alto. Um, yeah, so how many of you have heard the term Apollo 13 deployments? Anyone else heard that before? We had like a, we had like a phrase at, um, at this company for <laughs> every time we'd run deployments, you'd have like the lead back and engineer, the, the head of what we called script ops, um, and yeah, a few other people on Slack um, running manual database migrations, bringing production offline for 15 minutes, praying to the god of deployment that the server would come back up after everything was done, reconfiguring the VPC, all this other crap. This happened every two weeks. Every two weeks we deploy. It was very painful. Half the company would just turn Slack off because no one wanted to be online when this happened because it was so terrible. Um, and I would say about 25% of the time, we would get like all caps text messages from the VP of engineering at the time, telling everyone to get online and figure out why it wasn't coming back up because one of our large enterprise customers was screaming at the CEO on the telephone. So yeah, um, this was four years ago. So let that sink in. <laughs> um, and I, I, think a lot, I think that the story actually resonates with a lot of engineers that I've talked to. A lot of people are used to the sort of very painful deployments uh, model where, you know, when you deploy, it's a big deal, right? It's like Indiana Jones swapping the, I think it was a little bit of skull in the movie or something, swapping the skull off a little uh, thing, right? Like, that's the, deploys shouldn't feel that way. They should be painless, they should be easy, and they should be incremental. We don't want to have to, like, reinvent the wheel every time we roll out a new piece of infrastructure. We don't have to spin up a new cluster every time. I mean, we can, it's easy, but, you know, we don't want to make our life any harder than it has to be. So, on that sort of note, let's talk a little bit about Terraform. Who, are, who here has used Terraform before? No, wow, that's disappointing. Okay, I thought more people would, and that would make it me less anxious, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> okay, so no pressure. Uh, so Terraform is basically a pattern for describing your infrastructure in a language called the HashiCorp configuration language. Does anyone here use like any of the HashiCorp tools, like Vault, any of the other random tools? Okay, cool. So. HashiCorp configuration language is basically a programming language where you def define the state of the infrastructure you want in like this special like DSL. So it's like a special templating language where you say, okay, I'm going to use Google Cloud, and then in Google Cloud, I want a Kubernetes cluster with this many nodes with of this particular type attached to this particular VPC. And then I want to peer the VPC with the SQL server instance that I want to create at the same time using Cloud SQL. I want to peer that in. I want Redis. I want to peer that in. So basically, instead of having to like run a bunch of bat scripts or like use the UI or the CLI tool directly, you can just write your configuration in a set of files that you store right next to your source control, like your regular app code. So when you, you know, you version your app code and you add a new systems dependency, like, you know, you want to spin up Elasticsearch or something, right? Your, your new feature requires Elasticsearch. Well, you can add, you know, the, the Terraform configuration for Elasticsearch at the same time that you add the code for Elasticsearch. And then to test it, you can run a single command, spin up your own test cluster that includes Elasticsearch, peer it into the network, everything. And then you can tear it back down with another command. Um, so it's a really slick and easy way to sort of stand up and destroy infrastructure. And it's, it follows um, a couple of principles. First of all, infrastructure as code is like a new buzzword, and that's basically what I just described. So instead of, instead of like having to worry about someone going into Google Cloud or AWS, and doing a special snowflake configuration that no one knows about, and then when you try to make a change, it explodes. With infrastructure as code, you don't have to do that because everything is versioned in the repo along with your app code. So as I said before, like you, you know, you create your entire infrastructure in a single command, and everything's versioned together, which is great. All right, buzzword number two: Who here has used GraphQL? Okay, so I'm less anxious on this part. Okay, or more because maybe you'll call me on my bullshit. We'll see. 
Um, so I like to think of GraphQL as like an API mesh. Has anyone heard of the term service mesh before? If you, so basically the idea is instead of having to worry about how to network between your backend services, you really just want a piece of, like a system that sits there and it provides like basically pointers to all the other services on how to talk to one another. So it doesn't really matter, you know, what particular VPC the service is running on or what VM it's on or whatever. It's just instantly routable. So GraphQL is like that for APIs. So let's say you have like 20 microservices on your back end, which you know, it's not fun if you don't have this set up correctly. But let's say you have 20, right? And like you have a user service, a host service, comments, and all these other different services that handle certain resources on your back end, right? Um, without GraphQL, you have to build this very elaborate, like RESTful API on top of that. There's, well, there's two ways, actually. You could put authentication in every single service, which isn't fun. Or you can have a facade layer, like a RESTful facade, that your like front end code, like React to app or whatever, is talking through to hit the different microservices that terminates authentication. So it like checks the JWT in a header, it says, okay, this person's legit, and then it forwards the requests onto one or more underlying services. Um, that's kind of painful though, because if you've ever worked with that kind of facade tier before, you end up with like really weird and gnarly conventions for using like URI params to sort of expand out to other types. And it's all like custom hacked. So like there is no standard for doing it. You'll end up with an edge case that's not accounted for enough to add another UI RAM to traverse in a different direction and so forth. Um, and if you don't do this, you have to make like 20 requests to your backend every time you want to display a view. And that's like incredibly expensive. It makes your UI take like five seconds to load. No one likes that. Your users and your conversion rate drop off, right? So what GraphQL does instead is, is they kind of flip this on its head and they say that the that GraphQL says that a client, like a React app or a React Native app or iOS app, Android, whatever, can send a query language to your server that then your facade tier parses and dispatches HTTP requests or whatever other kind of request you want down to your underlying services to fetch your data. So with GraphQL, you sort of describe all of these different data types under the hood is like different types on a graph and they have relationships, just like a relational database, right? So you may have a user table and a comments table, right? Well, each comment was posted by a user. So there's a foreign key in that resource that points to the other resource, right? So with GraphQL, you just write like basically this thing called a resolver that maps, okay, if I wanna, if I wanna fetch the user who wrote this post, get, I take the user, or yeah, I take the post, and then I make a request to the user service for the user with that primary key. That's basically all it is. People get confused with GraphQL because they think it's like another SQL implementation or something that couples to the database, but it really doesn't. It's really just a replacement for a RESTful facade API. That's it. And then of course, the Google Cloud Platform. So I'm obviously biased. My friend Kurt at AWS won't like this if, because he's gonna watch this later. Sorry, Kurt. Um, I like to view Google Cloud Platform as if like someone took AWS and made all the parts actually work well together. Like, and then they felt kind of seamless and maybe reduce the feature set slightly in ways that no one actually misses. That's what you get with Google Cloud Platform. So everything just kind of works. It, things feel very intuitive and simple. You don't have to like jump around 50 different UIs to spin up infrastructure. Um, it also has the best managed Kubernetes, another buzzword, who's used to Kubernetes here. Okay. Um, it has the best managed Kubernetes offering on the market, in my opinion, because obviously Google builds Kubernetes. They also build Google Cloud Platform. There's actually a significant overlap between the two teams. So, um, you know, Amazon has their EKS offering, but it's always, you know, a, at least a quarter behind where Google is with their offering. So, oh, not supposed to go there. So, yeah, let me um, kind of just unshare my screen. Cool. Kind of go over and show you, like, I created, like, a really simple API and Terraform setup. And I'm not gonna bore you by actually deploying the infrastructure. I'm gonna run a command that's gonna run Terraform apply. Yep, yeah, yeah. Sorry, it's been a while since I used a Mac, maybe not. There we go, cool. Everyone knows I'm off. Is that better? A couple more? Cool. So like, if I run Terraform apply, ops Terraform, I already have a cluster running that I've already applied. And the reason that I'm not sort of gonna show you guys a full deploy right now is because it could take like 20 minutes. Um, and that's a lot of time to be sitting here just silently waiting for it to finish. So the Terraform is already run at my house and in the Uber on the way over here. Um, thank you, quite, um, you know, sell your, I'll tell you the hotspots. So if I go to like cloud or console.cloud,
Cool. So with the command I ran earlier, <laughs> it created a Kubernetes cluster. Three nodes, uh, dual cores apiece, about 16 gigs of RAM, or more than that, 32. Yeah. Um, it created a SQL server instance, and I'll show you the files in just a second. It peered them, so if we go to like PC. So it peered all the systems together so that like obviously each piece of infrastructure has done private PC and we want to make sure they can talk to each other. Um, it kind of just set up everything. Like we don't we don't really have to do anything with command line manually or with um, the UI, it just works. So this is the entire sort of Terraform configuration. So in Terraform, you typically sort of use this weird kind of syntax, like I said, it's HCL. Oh yes. Oops, is that good? Okay, is that good or a little thicker? Okay, cool. So this is this block basically just says that if I try to run Terraform and I'm not using the right version of the CLI, version 0 0.12 or above, which is latest, to throw an error. Um, and then I'm registering a couple of providers. So these are just cloud providers. It's saying that I'm going to talk to Google's like cloud default APIs, and I'm also going to use some of their data APIs as well. And we're going to use this service account file that is generated elsewhere, and I'm not going to show you because I like my privacy. Um, and we're going to use the US Central One region, which is all in Iowa. So there are some variables. Um, the project ID, the cloud SQL username, cloud SQL password. None of these are like secret because it's just a bullshit project. But basically, in Terraform, you can create these special environment variables that start with TF underscore bar in all caps. And it automatically maps those into like variables that you can use in your Terraform code. So the meaty parts, this is Kubernetes. So we're creating, we're enabling the Kubernetes service because we actually have to turn on that API with Google. You don't just get it. You have to actually enable the APIs if you want them. We're saying that if I, when I tear this infrastructure down, we don't want to destroy this permission. We want to leave the API on. We just want to disable it. And then here's the cluster itself. So we're, we give it a name, main cluster. That maps to the actual name here, main cluster. We're going to give it three initial VMs. We're going to run it in Iowa. We're not going to add any authentication because we don't really need it because it's all on the VPC. And there's only an ingress IP that points into the load balancer, so we don't care about auth right now. We're going to use IP aliases, which allow the cluster to connect very easily to other VPC networks inside. So for like Redis and SQL, that's important. And then here's the configuration for each node. So we want each VM to be an N1 standard 2. That's like the pricing tier for the VM. We want to grant it some initial OAuth scopes for stack driver, compute management, that kind of thing. And we want to give it a tag so that it's searchable for CLI if we want to go back to it. Then we also want Redis because we're building a real time GraphQL API in a second. And Guess what? Real time you pups up. So Redis has pups up. So again, we're going to enable the MenStore service and we're going to create it. Same kind of idea. These are called resources. We're creating a Redis instance resource. We're using the basic pricing here because it's cheap and I'm a cheapskate. Um, and we're telling it that first wait for the, the API to be, to be online because we don't want to try to create the Redis instance before the API is actually enabled. So with Terraform, you kind of describe this DAG at times. If there's a reference between two resources, it'll automatically figure out that it needs to resolve the first one within a second. But in this case, we're not actually referencing the API. So we have to like implicitly use this depends on annotation to say, wait until Google project service dot memory store is complete before trying to create the memory store instance. And then lastly, SQL, which is by far the most complicated part here because databases love to make everything complicated. So we have to enable a few things. We create the databases and yada, yada, yada. And we peer the network with the Kubernetes uh, network right here. So just a bunch of stuff that you've already kind of seen in the other two files. Let's skip over it. Cool. So at the end of that, we have a fully running Kubernetes cluster. And I'll run the command again, which just kind of shows that what Terraform does is it checks the state um, that's actually in the cloud against the state that you're saying you want deployed. And then it diffs it. So if there's things that need to be destroyed, it destroys them. If there are things that need to be created, it adds them. It modifies things that are already in flight and so forth. Um, so if you ever need to like flex your infrastructure in a way, like add new networks or partition things differently, you just edit the files, run a command, and it's done. And because there's no changes that need to be made right now, it's obviously done. Nothing to do. So let's see how we're doing on time. Cool. So um, now on to the more hipster technology than Terraform, which is GraphQL that everyone nowadays talks about. So I'm not going to bore you by going through this entire project like I did with Terraform. If you want to know how to build a GraphQL API, go to the Apollo server docs. They're very robust. 
Um, I will kind of go over this in a nutshell. So in GraphQL, you write a schema that kind of looks like this. So you have these three root types in a GraphQL system. Um, you have the query root type, the mutation root type, and the subscription root type. So queries are the difference between a query and a mutation. They're basically the exact same thing, except that if you send a bunch of like, if you batch send a bunch of operations from the client to the server and they're annotated as a mutation, they always run sequentially, one at a time. The reason for this is because they're, the, the assumption is you're updating data rather than loading it. And you, when you update data, you want to make that sure that things are FIFO, they're not ran run concurrently because you can end up with some weird race conditions. So yeah, we, on the type query, we, we add like a root query called get users, and I'll more on that in a second. And then on the mutation, we add a method to create a user and update a user. And the subscriptions are its own special thing. So subscriptions allow you to either via HTTP2 or WebSockets um, send a query to the server. The server remembers that this, that you wanted this data if it ever changes. And then as other people send like mutations downstream or other underlying systems change data, it pipes it back to the client in real time. So think of it as like socket IO, just sort of baked into this, the, the pattern. You don't have to like roll your own real time system with your graph developers kind of works. So these are the scary things that I mentioned before called resolvers. These basically just say, how do I get from this particular part in the operation to your data. So with this particular implementation, I'm actually just wiring GraphQL directly up to the database. So I'm using SQLize and a very fancy form of SQLize called SQLize TypeScript that lets me like write Java S code because I'm, I guess I enjoy punishment, I don't know. Um, so basically we're defining a table, you know, we have a primary key and then we have a name for each user, right? And then our, we have a model file that actually uses the table and does stuff. So, you know, get all, that's just going to find all users. Create is going to create a user. Update's going to like upsert a user, basically. So we go back to our schema. We'll see that we're actually calling these on this thing called context. And in GraphQL, it's usually best practice to pass references to these data fetching, data updating things down through a thing called con uh, context. But you can think of it as like with Express, you have request and response to come in. And a lot of times it's useful to strap extra things on requests as they come down via middleware. Um, like request.body, obviously body parser straps that on after parsing the raw request from the body, right? Um, GraphQL is the same thing, it's just called context. So this is like a shared object that's passed around all the resolvers that get invoked throughout the lifecycle of an operation. So I have the GraphQL server running and in a glorious hack, because I didn't want to wait on EKs and ingress to come online, I'm actually typing this I'm proxying Kubernetes to my laptop, and then I'm using ingrok to proxy my laptop out to the internet. So don't judge me. Um, if you guys want to play around with it, you can just go to boltsource.ingrok.io right now. And I actually encourage you to. I'm going to write in a mutation real quick. It's, already, it's actually already up here. So I'm going to create a user called Andrew Ryan. I'm going to go ahead and turn on the subscription right here to listen for new users being created. But yeah, if, you, if anyone puts anything disgusting on here, I'm immediately turning it off. So no one please do that. All right, so voila, Andrew Ryan pops up. I put another user, like, you know, Turd Ferguson. There we go, we'll get dirty. I think I spelled that right, probably not. Suddenly Turd Ferguson pops up on the subscription. So basically, the kind of what I'm trying to get out here is like, coming back to the original story, I remember at this company having 20 requests for UI with a five second load time with users calling and raging. I remember outages because people would secure shell into the server and like make little modifications here and there and that person would leave and no one would know about it and a landmine would go off later and we hired a new DevOps person and so forth. I found that using these three technologies in conjunction for over the past two years, Kubernetes, GraphQL, and Terraform has significantly reduced the amount of late night Apollo 13 of the late crap I've had. Uh, things just kind of work. I, most of the systems I build, we deploy, you know, 10 to 20 times a day with no problems. Um, so yeah, sorry, I feel like that was kind of a lightning talk, but whatever. Yeah. Cool. Any questions? So, um, so these terraform, like, you, you have a network of kubeconf. Uh, for this, I did because I ran out of time. But you can totally replace kubeconf with terraform. Um, it has a driver for Kubernetes, and you can just write Terraform for all of it and map values. Like, you create like a static IP, you can map the IP directly into your ingress on your kube. 
it's super easy. You, uh, you know, like, uh, okay, so with the infinite repetitor, if I don't want to use the number, I want to use the closing time, do you know how to get the, the uh, output from the infinite cluster, get those certificates, and then be able to authenticate using the infinite repetitor to then go into that? Yep. So, um, yeah, so if you're using Google Cloud, all you have to do is create a service account, get the service account access to, I, I mean, I was greedy on this. I gave it ownership rights over the entire yeah. project. So uh, that's what I was doing before, but what I want to do is uh, have my infinite provider automatically get the authentication from the, but I created a service account. Oh, maybe I want to. Yeah, it's, it's weird because with the back end and the provider specifically, they don't let you do a lot of magical things with. Yeah. Um, it screams at you for it. I'm hoping at some point they'll add auto fetching or something where you can map like the value from the project into another provider. But right now, all the providers are processed at the exact same time. Yeah. So you can't like map the credentials from one provider to the other. Yeah. That's a cool idea though, for sure. What's up? I'm familiar with the Ansible. I've used Ansible a little bit. Um, so I would say that I was limited to using Ansible a lot like people use Chef. Um, so it's more like configuring VMs, at least that's how I was using it. Uh, Terraform is more like, have you ever read like how Netflix approaches microservices? It's the idea that you basically, you, there is no special VM. Like every VM is like a cow in a cow farm. If, if a cow dies, no one gets sad and has a funeral for it, right? It's just, I mean, hopefully there are no vegans here, there probably are, but yeah, you get the point. So um, if I've, I've used Ansible in, in terms of like standing up custom, like baking custom VM images. Um, Terraform kind of eschews that. I mean, you can do that with Terraform, but the idea is more that you're running containers usually. So you're using Terraform to provision like native cloud native infrastructure, um, where you don't really care what's on the VM as long as it has a Docker host. So I can't, have you talked to anybody who's using AppSync so they don't have to do any apps at all? Yeah, my friend Kurt. I, yeah, yeah. So. Uh, yeah, I, I know some people who are working at AWS on some interesting things along those lines, yes. I haven't used it, no. What's your preferred CI CD process for a setup like this? Honestly, I try to leverage whatever the cloud provider offers. So for me, I you try to use Google Cloud Builds. Um, I was a sort of a CI fanboy for a long time, but it's really nice having everything in the same sort of you don't have to worry about the networking or opening security holes, everything just kind of works, absolutely. Uh, hey. Sorry, um, I had a little hard, I had a hard time um, really hearing your question. So you're saying uh, using the infrastructure? Yes, so when you run like Terraform apply and you've made a change to your Terraform code, it automatically diffs the deployed infrastructure with uh, the, the desired state that's in the file and then it makes the modifications. It can modify, destroy, and create new infrastructure. And you want to probably update Yes. <laughs> Specifically, if you modify your database, that can get a little tricky. So if you want to manage, like I'm managing databases with Terraform, but if you, but it requires that you set up like triggers to automatically back up, like before it actually destroys the database and spins up a new one, which sounds terrifying, but if you just do a quick snapshot and then pull it back in, you're not really losing anything, especially if you port it off the network while you're doing it. Um, but yeah, you have to be careful when you're working with stateful infrastructure with Terraform because you can really Cost your company billions of dollars. Yeah, it, it really depends on how you work with databases. Um, I try to avoid managing them with Kubernetes because I can use Cloud SQL and it just manages it for me. Um, mostly because I don't like having that VM that had the persistent volume die. I said, well.
Right, let's go to Brandon. Cool.